I want to thank you again for uh, joining us in this uh, series on Genesis 1 through 11. In our last session, we uh, covered the uh, flood of Noah in Genesis 6 through 9. Today, I wanted to look at what was the aftermath of that. What did Noah come out of the ark to find? What kind of a world was it? The Lord said to Noah, this is in Genesis 8, 16, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh. He then made a covenant with Noah, as we saw in the last session. He said, I will establish my covenant with you and your descendants. And of course, that's all of mankind. All of mankind has come from Shem, uh, Japheth, and um, Ham. This is in 8.20, Genesis 8.20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and offered uh, burnt offerings on the altar. These were of the clean animals that were he kept on the ark, uh, seven pairs, so he had some for sacrifices. And God said, I will set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. When Adam sinned, he went from the Garden of Eden to the world that existed before Noah. That continued, but it was a fall and a judgment, and it was less than they'd had before. And it was caused between an interchange between fallen angels, Satan in particular, and mankind. Now, in the time of Noah, we have this interchange again. It's a question of sin and God's judgment, and the world that's after the flood is a lot different than the world before. But God's made a covenant. I won't destroy it again by water. What was left after the flood? You have geological structures were left by the flood of Noah, deep sedimentary layers full of fossils were deposited by the catastrophic flood waters over the whole face of the earth. What we have today is we call the three types of rocks we have. We have sedimentary, we have igneous rock, which comes sedimentary is laid down by water. Igneous is volcanic. And then you have your metamorphic, which is things that existed before that are crushed by tremendous pressure, having been deep in the earth and then brought back to the surface again. Um, and, and, but the sedimentary are very prominent because they're the ones that have the fossils in it. These were the things that were laid down. They're not igneous and they're not metamorphic. These were the ones that were laid down in the flood, trapping huge amounts of plants and animals. The world was full of those before the flood. There were also, as we're going to see, other structures were left. Their deep sedimentary layers were deposited. Some, such as the Grand Canyon, formed a fold up due to tectonic motion. Waters built up behind it and then cut through them. And they were cut through while they were still soft. These were not cut when they were hard. They were cut when they were still soft and sedimentary layers had been laid down, folded up, and then the waters cut through them and cut these deep trenches through them. In other places, you have deep sedimentary layers were folded without fracturing because they were still moist and soft by tectonic movements. This is a whole mountain of whole layers that are bent, and you cannot bend those when those are hard. They'll just shatter. These were all bent when they're soft, and they have, again, a, a lot of fossils and... Um, in them of plants and animals, it was laid down and then folded up and bent, and it had to be bent very shortly after they were laid down. You also have huge tropical forests were uprooted and deposited by the floodwaters forming massive alluvial coal beds over the whole face of the earth. You find them all over Antarctica, up in the Arctic regions. Uh, you find them uh, through Europe, uh, Asia, um, the Americas, all over the earth, and they're made out of the same thing, the same uh, types of plants. And these were trapped. They're not laid down by bogs or in the bottom of a lake or something else. They'll all decompose before they're compressed. But they were crushed down, compressed, and we can, when you open them up, you can see the fossils, the trees, palms, and the uh, lycopods are 
for most of the coal beds. And they're very sharp seams. These were not, coal beds were not found where they were growing because they're sharp seams. There are no roots down inside of them. If there's any roots, the roots are in, integrated with the branches and the uh, uh, upper parts of the tree and they're laid down. In some cases, you have trees going up through several layers with the limestone seam between them. And they're soft, they're coal. It's impossible to do by long periods of time. These things were suddenly buried and kept away from organic uh, bacterial action that would have decomposed them. After the flood, volcanoes, because of the tectonics, would be pushing up new land masses and mountains with great violence. Volcanic islands were pushed up and oceans before the flood because of the canopy were very warm. And they were pushed up and superheated also by these volcanoes pushing up through the thing. So the oceans at this point become very warm. They're warm before, they become even warmer because of the volcanic action. After the flood, the volcanoes continued. This is the, Noah's out, the flood ceased, but the volcanoes continue to erupt up through these fissures. And they bring valuable minerals and igneous rock to the Earth's surface. Without the water canopy, the waters above, the post-flood world, the post -flood world developed temperature zones with cold temperatures at both of the poles and warm temperatures, in contrast, would have developed around its equator. So you now, what you didn't have before, which the fossils indicate, your index fossils indicate, you don't have polar regions, you don't have temperature zones, they were all the same. Now you have at each pole very cold temperatures because there's no canopy to distribute the solar radiation equally over the whole surface, like it happens on Venus, which still has a canopy. So you get very warm temperatures at the, at the equator and very cold temperatures at the poles. After the flood, these massive volcanoes uh, caused by the flood uh, tectonics ominously pumped ash, volcanic ash, into the atmosphere. Huge amounts, because they're all going off at the same time. They're not singular cases. There's a lot of them formed because of the flood. This volcanic ash from these massive eruptions filled the whole Earth's post-flood atmosphere. These uh, volcanic uh, ash clouds then blocked the solar radiation and rapidly cooled the atmosphere to very low temperatures. Do you see what's happening here? You got warm oceans. You all of a sudden have polar regions that are cold. But in addition to that, they're going to get even colder because this ash is blow, covering the, uh, blocking the sun's radiation. So they're going to be very, very cold in the north and the south poles. And they'll also be colder at the equator, but not as much as the poles. Cold atmospheric temperatures and massive volcanic eruptions triggered huge storms, especially in the new polar regions. In these new cold polar regions, these huge storms turned dramatically into snow blizzards. Volcanoes, this warm ocean temperature giving off lots of humidity and very cold temperatures at the poles fueled massive polar snow blizzards day and night. This is a picture that you see in the, uh, of a recent one that was going off and you can see the lightning going off in the thing and it, it blocks the sun and lowers the temperature and you have huge storms taking place, especially if you have a source from the new oceans that are very warm pumping all this, or the larger ones, pumping all this uh, humidity into the air, hitting these cold regions. The blizzards blanketed the polar landscapes with massive accumulations of snow day and night. Huge mammoths and other extinct animals, these are from the pre-flood, feeding on semi-tropical <clears throat> grasslands in northern Siberia, were trapped by the flood waters and silt from that, and by the post-flood uh, snows, then covered this thing and lowered these temperatures to freeze them in mass. Millions of pre-flood animals perished in the flood and were frozen by the post-flood uh, snows. This is a, a picture here of one of these uh, hairy mammoths. Here are the re frozen remains of a mammoth that was found in Siberia 
almost 100 years ago, which was partially eaten by wolves uh, after partial thawing that takes place in every spring and summer. This is taxidermy remains of the same mammoth from Siberia. The fierce polar snow blizzards begin to cover up the newly formed mountains and to fill the valleys. In the, these are in the polar regions. Snow soon covered most of the newly formed mountains in the polar regions. Fed by moisture from the large uh, warm oceans, the polar blizzards continued unabated. Descendants of Noah were driven back by the blizzards to the warmest parts of the earth near Babylon. As we stated before, around Babylon you have the, Babylon's the warmest, warmest capital in the world. And it was around this area that they came out and stayed during this uh, tremendous snowstorms developing in the north and the south regions. Rapidly, the ice age snow covered all of the earth's polar ter terrains. The deep snow compacted into ice age glaciers, often more than a mile deep. The ice age glaciers begin to move. They were pushed by large snow accumulations and pulled by gravity. These huge glaciers ground up everything in front of them, even mountains. These continental-sized glaciers changed all of the terrain, moving glacial materials hundreds of miles in a relatively short amount of time. Moisture to produce the intense but brief Ice Age, snow, and glaciers came from warm oceans, which lost 300 to 500 feet of depth during this period of time. As the volcanoes stopped, the atmosphere began to warm up again because it's not clouded, the solar radiation. The warm oceans, giving off all this humidity, begin to cool down in contrast, and the glaciers begin to melt. Great rivers created by the melting glaciers return the snow melt uh, waters to the oceans. And that's why many of our, our uh, even in the United States, many of our rivers are so much wider than they are today. Our rivers just meander down through them. Even during a flood, they may fill up the valley, but the current does. Whereas under the glacial melt, these things would have been filled up and cut these large river valleys like the Mississippi, the Missouri, you have others like the, uh, the Kansas, which was at the southern edge of the glacial region. The melting ice age glaciers left a strange landscape and glacial deposits in their wake. Receding glaciers left sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic rock, fossils, and minerals in glacial deposits down to the 38th parallel from both poles. So you have these, this ice age came all the way down to the 38th parallel from the north and the south poles, leaving only the equatorial zone uh, unglacierized. And that's what we find today, the remains of these glaciers. As far south as Kansas, Missouri in the United States, uh, these huge deposits of stones, they call them erratics, brought from seven or 800 miles north of here crushing and leveling everything in their way. Huge tropical forests, uprooted and deposited by the flood deposits, form massive alluvial coal beds and oil fields for the Earth's energy supplies. In other words, our energy supplies are residues of the flood action, leaving coal deposits and oil deposits that were buried during this period of time. The deep sedimentary Layers over the whole earth were deposited, folded, and cut through by the huge uh, floodwaters while still soft. The massive alluvial layers from the Noahic flood and the glacial ice age are the basic building materials for modern civilization. Our rock coming out of the, the sedimentary layers and our sands from the glacial deposits ground up and left for us to build our civilizations out of it be very difficult to build without these two basic building blocks. Science and its laws harmonize with the biblical creation, the fall of man, and the Noahic flood, 
the two judgments that came after the creation. The basic laws of science originated in two historical events as we've seen in Genesis 1 and 3. The first law with Genesis 1, conservation of matter and energy, and two, the increasing entropy or disorder of the second law with the curse in Genesis 3. The, the physics, as we have seen, of the speed of light from Maxwell supports the biblical account of a young universe. Geological records agree with the biblical account of the pre-flood earth conditions, climatic, environmental, geophysical, and biological. The fossil records confirm the biblical account of the pre-flood plants and animals where you had almost 100 times more than you have today, spread evenly over the earth. Sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic formations confirm the biblical account of a catastrophic worldwide flood and the post-flood ice age, which is, can't be explained in any way of the climatic conditions according to uniformitarianism. Also, the recent floods, volcanic eruptions and tsunamis that we've had and earthquakes in modern times confirm on a small scale the effects of a biblical worldwide flood. We had one tsunami and it killed a minimum of a quarter million people in just a matter of hours. And that was on a small scale. That wasn't worldwide. Glacial deposits that we find out there verify the biblical post-flood ice age. As you go out there, these were glaciers that were all the way down into Kansas, Missouri, Ohio. And it meant that it was ice in the middle of August. Impossible to arrive at in any other way than a, a, a post-flood ice age. Modern physics, geology, astronomy that's taught, and biology of secular humanism, or secular naturalism, I should say, cannot explain the origins or the present conditions of the earth, universe, or life. Scientific laws and data confirm God's creation of the universe and the catastrophic worldwide results of God's judgment in the flood, contrary to naturalism's, and I put it in quotes, science. Again, I want to thank you, and I uh, will carry on on our next session, looking into the world that took place after the flood, and what mankind did in that period of time, leading to another judgment. Thanks. Thanks.